Hi everybody, let's talk temperature, or as I like to call it, the T, the big T. The is of what is temperature is something I think we all have a sense of, not too difficult to explain. Um, if you live in an area of four seasons, meaning a hot summer and a cold winter, um, if you don't live in such a place, uh, if you live in a place that's always warm, I recommend you remain there. Uh, if you live in a place that's always cold, you might want to consider to migrate to somewhere that has four seasons. But if you do live in a place that has four seasons, uh, then you know in the winter you wake up and you say, wow, let me go into the shower. Let me adjust those dials. And oh, hot water. We feel that heat, that hotness. Um, on the other hand, if it's a hot summer day, get home after a jog or workout, we're really hot, go in the shower, we adjust the knobs a bit differently, and that same substance, water comes out, and wow, it's cold, fantastic. So we have uh, an innate sense of something that is uh, hot and something that is cold. It's the same substance, water, but somehow that same substance can be hot or it can be cold. Uh, we know that from our common experience. You didn't need to get interested in thermodynamics to know that. You already know that things are hot and things are cold. We can make a very long list of things that are hot and are cold. Think about pausing this video and jotting down five things that are hot and jotting down five things that are cold. What did you come up with? Hot things? Well, if you go to the beach in the summer and take your shoes off, you'll feel those hot grains of sand. Uh, if you uh, start up the oven and hold your hand near, you'll feel that hot, that heat, so to speak, we say, with that hotness of the oven. Uh, similarly, uh, if there's snow and you go out without gloves and you make a snowball, you'll feel the coldness, the coldness of that snow. Uh, so it's very easy for us to think of things that are hot and things that are cold. They're all part of our natural daily experience. Now, what thermodynamics will try to do is to uh, bring a formalism to that hotness and coldness and then bring a use to it after bringing a formalism to it. So the first thing we need if we're going to bring a formalism to hotness and coldness is we need a quantitative measure. How hot? Give me a number. How cold? Give me a number. So temperature needs a number. Okay, it turns out if you've got ice and water and you go basically anywhere on the planet Earth, you get the same coldness. Doesn't matter how much ice you've got in the bucket, doesn't matter how much water you've got in the bucket, as long as you've got ice and water, you have what we call an invariant point. You feel the same coldness. So since you have that invariant point, let's give it a number on our temperature to quantify it. Let's give it the number zero. If you have just ice, you can get more cold. If you have just water, you can get more warm. But as long as you have just a little bit of water and a whole lot of ice, or a little bit of ice and a whole lot of water, you feel the same coldness, an invariant point. Let's call that temperature zero. Now that that boiling water, as long as you are near the surface of the earth, uh, sea level, that boiling water has a certain hotness of a fixed temperature. Um, it doesn't matter if there's a little boiling water, doesn't matter if there's a lot of boiling water, as long as that water is boiling and you're near sea level, the temperature, the hotness is the same. So another invariant point. So let's give that a number. Mm, a good number if we have zero for our coldness point, a good number for our hotness point, let's call it 100. Okay, so we have some anchor points. We have ice water, which we called zero, and we have boiling water at sea level, which we called 100. How can we think about doing the gradations between zero and 100? So it turns out, let's take uh, ethanol, rubbing alcohol, um, and let us put a certain amount into a graduated cylinder that measures volume in milliliters. And we put in just enough so that when this cylinder is in ice water, uh, we hit a value of 124. So we have 124 milliliters as a starting point. Uh, uh, we fill it up. It's at our zero point. 
Okay, so that's a starting point. I could have filled it with 150, I could have filled it with 70, but I choose to fill it with 124 milliliters. Now, what's interesting is if I take then that same cylinder, but now I put it into our boiling water, the density of the alcohol changes, meaning that its volume uh, changes, and it actually increases to 140 milliliters. So that means that we could use the difference between 124 and 140. We could take that, so that's about 16 milliliters. We could divide that into, say, 100 equal steps. And then we would say be able to look at our temperature from our zero point to our 100 point in 100 equal steps by looking at all the small changes in volume as we go stepwise from 124 to 140. Now, that would work, but it's not too convenient because the visualization is quite small. So, clever people have figured out how to visualize this better. Instead of using a graduated cylinder, we'll put a lot of volume in a bulb at the bottom, and then we'll have a very narrow tube, which is the uh, capillary tube. And that means that as we go from 124 to 140, as the volume changes, well, the only place for that alcohol to go is up this capillary tube. So what was a small change when we're looking in the, in the geometry of a graduated cylinder actually turns into a large change uh, when we have the bulb connected to a capillary and, of course, sealed. The whole, whole glassware is sealed so we don't get any evaporation of the, uh, of the alcohol. Now, taking to that to the next step then, we have a large reservoir volume of alcohol. Uh, in this case, uh, the example showed mercury, which is an historical fluid that also expands like alcohol, uh, but it's hazardous to health, so it's been replaced by alcohol. So in our case, this will be the alcohol. As that alcohol expands in the capillary tube, well, all we have to do is mark what we would call our zero point and mark what we would call our 100 point and then come along and do 100 gradations on the glassware. And then we would be able to go from 0 to 1 to 2 and so on to 99. And of course, we can go above it in a linear trend. And we can go below it, negative 1, negative 2, as at, when we go into coldness, the volume retreats. Or if we go above boiling water, the volume continues to uh, expand. We can choose what to mark it with. We're going to mark it with Celsius, degree C, because degree C are defined for zero as ice water and 100 as boiling water at sea level. Okay, so visualizing that, here you will recognize the uh, standard uh, thermometer, and this is what that thermometer, here's the bulb, looks like as it is dipped a bulb connected to a capillary tube as it's dipped into liquids at different temperatures. Okay, and so when dipped at this level, well, you're at about minus, uh, let's see, let's call that minus uh, 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 20, a little bit lower, maybe minus 21 degrees Celsius. And when we're at this level, we are at 30 degrees Celsius. If we continue to put this thermometer into something of greater hotness, then the liquid continues to expand. Uh, now we're up to something that might be on the order of 60 degrees Celsius. So now we have a tool to quantify coldness and hotness, allowing us to do quantitative science and engineering. Let's talk a little bit about the range of temperatures you're likely to experience in real life. The lowest temperature that's easily accessible to you is probably liquid nitrogen. So that sets kind of a lower bound on what you will actually experience. We call that minus 196 degrees Celsius. We also have what's called absolute zero, which on the Celsius scale is about minus 273 Celsius, or on the Kelvin scale, uh, which is referenced absolute zero, the Kelvin scale starts 
at zero Kelvin and liquid nitrogen is 77 Kelvin. So in your real life, you're probably going to experience liquid nitrogen as your lowest accessible temperature. 77 Kelvin minus 196 Celsius. The hotness that you'll experience in real life, well, uh, the maximum hotness you might experience in your real life, of course they're exotic, scientific places to go, but in real life maybe this blow torch uh, 3500 Celsius, iron and steel melting at about 1500 Celsius. Um, the upper limit of materials is quite important because they start to uh, melt. And as you can see here, uh, iron and stainless steel, 1500 uh, Celsius. So you might have an operational range in your life with an upper limit of 1500 Celsius. Now, a theme that will continue is that if we have liquid inside this pot, it has a certain temperature, T for temperature. Uh, and that temperature, well, that's given by nature. It's a, a value that exists. But humans, we make the situation more complicated. We have different ways to think about it. Sometimes we're talking Kelvin, sometimes we're talking Celsius, sometimes we're talking Fahrenheit, Rankin, uh, Newton. Uh, we talk in different ways about temperature. So how are these different scales of temperatures related to each other? Well, Kelvin is often what we use in thermodynamics, absolute zero. Uh, and it is, uh, you can't have a negative Kelvin. It's where temperature starts, a minimum energy. We can always relate Kelvin and Celsius. They have a very easy relationship. If we want to go from Kelvin to Celsius, uh, well, then we should subtract 273. So zero Kelvin is minus 273.15 Celsius. So that's the lowest Celsius we can ever have. We can never have minus 280 Celsius, just like we can never have below zero uh, uh, Kelvin. Uh, conversely, if we have a freezing point of water and we want to get to Kelvin, uh, well, then we should add 273. So zero Celsius is 273.15 uh, Kelvin. The relationships uh, on the other scales can be a bit more uh, complicated. Rather than go through them, let's look at a uh, visualization of them. So uh, if we think about things we know about our common experience our human body temperature which is 37 degrees on the celsius scale well let's follow it up to these other different scales so if we're on the newton scale we'd intersect close to zero if we're on the fahrenheit scale we intersect close to 100 you know that's 98.6 if we're on the the kelvin scale then we're up a little bit over uh, 300 if we're on the Rankine scale. Okay. Now, there is one scale in here that's pretty interesting. You see, most of them have in common that as we go from uh, things that are cold, like absolute zero, and then the lowest recorded surface temperature, and then melting point of ice, and then the human body temperature, and then warmest temperature on earth up to boiling water as we increase in hotness most of these have in common that they go up okay temperature goes up um, they go up they have different anchor points if we think of an equation like y equals mx plus b they have different intercepts anchor points and they have different slopes some increase more rapidly uh, than others. But there is at least one in here that's quite interesting, which is uh, this uh, DeLille scale, which actually is defined the other way around. That's interesting, isn't it? So that would mean cold temperatures are large numbers and uh, hot temperatures are low numbers. Obviously, that's not the scale we use widely. Um, there are other scales uh, out there. Um, Fahrenheit is used a lot in uh, the United States. Celsius is used in day-to-day -day life around the world and other countries. Kelvin is used in scientific laboratories around the world. Many engineers, especially in the United States, will use uh, uh, Rankine uh, units. 
Now, there's this interesting one. I always like to pull out an interesting one. The uh, DeLille scale um, goes back to 1732, and it was defined uh, by saying a zero point, the fixed point, the zero point will be boiling water. So in our case, we took boiling water as 100, but uh, DeLille took boiling water as zero. Okay, that's fine. And then said, well, as the temperature gets uh, 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 colder, as I feel uh, more coldness, I'll use 150 uh, degrees as the freezing point of water. So it actually uses the same anchor points that we used, but uh, whereas we set freezing point at zero and boiling point at uh, 100, um, uh, DeLille set the uh, boiling point at zero and the freezing point at uh, 150, which gives then the opposite uh, uh, slope. Interestingly enough, uh, the Celsius scale that we used was also initially uh, defined in this inverted way. It was meaning uh, a zero to 100, but for zero as boiling water and 100 for freezing water, it was only later that that scale was reversed and described uh, the way that I did today, um, again, which is used widely around the world. Zero is the anchor point for freezing water, 100 is the anchor point for boiling water at sea level, and then uh, uh, using the uh, gradation with the thermometer for 100 uh, steps and being able to go past the two endpoints for negative and above 100. Okay, so kind of everyday temperatures. Uh, if one's doing a uh, weather report, um, 30 is hot, 20 is nice, uh, one's air conditioning might be at 22, 23, um, a, a very hot heat wave at 40 Celsius. We're uh, concerned about uh, folks' uh, health on the street. 10 is cold, zero is ice. Um, the human body, 37 degrees uh, Celsius, what we call the typical room temperature where we're co comfortable, 20 Celsius. Um, if we talk about something really hot, surface of the earth, 5,600 uh, Celsius. So, from our human experience, you know about hotness, you know about coldness. What we learned today is how to quantify it with what we call temperature. We needed an invariant point, which was ice, a bucket of ice water, which we called zero. Uh, and we needed another invariant point, which was boiling water at, uh, at, at sea level, which we called 100. Some folks before us have thought about these same invariant points, Celsius or centigrade. So we have a scale from zero degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, from freezing water to boiling water. Uh, and then we saw a way to quantify it is to construct a thermometer based, for example, on the steady uh, uh, decrease in the density of alcohol uh, with temperature. We look at that in a capillary tube, we put 100 gradations on it, and uh, we have a way to measure temperature from zero to 100 Celsius. We can continue those gradations above 100, continue those gradations below zero, and get negative temperatures, temperatures over 100. So now we have a tool to quantify coldness or hotness. Acabou.